First of all, I want to I want to thank those who have organized this uh, in bringing this Green Book exhibit uh, to California and, and many of the other things that they're doing. Uh, one of our challenges in, in, in Secretary of State's office is obviously trying to make sure that our archives are truly a reflection of all of California and not just some of California. Um, and this is Black History Month and uh, we're almost at the end of it and, and, and I can tell you that it's the hardest working month of the year for me. Um, I wanted and asked a question, am I the only part of black history people know because everybody <laughs> seems to at the state is uh, inviting me to be a part of things and I loved Black History Month, but I like to listen. I really like to learn and so I was just enthralled with the poetry that uh, we heard from uh, the intergenerational poetry team that we just uh, had a chance to hear uh, because it is always such a, a, an amazing experience in terms of creativity but also addressing messages and issues that we sometimes forget. So I really appreciate those who were a part of that as well as all the program that's occurring today to celebrate African American History Month. Um, California has a very rich history and, uh, and that history is often clouded in the sun, <laughs> interestingly enough, that we don't focus upon the diversity of California when we really should. And I'm optimistic that that will, continue, that will happen and even happen more as we have passed legislation to make sure that uh, every, every graduate in California gets some ethnic studies history uh, and also that we have a K-12 agenda now that everyone in K-12 will learn something about uh, ethnic history uh, so that we get the full picture of California, but full picture of the United States so that all of our kids can feel included and feel a part of it. Um, this is an interesting conversation for me um, and uh, I'm hoping that it will be a conversation that I can share some things with you. Uh, we can talk about the Green Book uh, and we can then begin uh, to ask questions and dialogue about uh, the implications of the Green Book itself. Um, as pointed out, I'm, I'm, I'm a daughter of the, of the uh, Jim Crow South. I was born in Hope, Arkansas. Um, and uh, during the era of Jim Crow. And my parents, I was the youngest of, at the time, the, the family was six when we came, to, there were six kids when we came to California, I was the youngest. Obviously there were two others born in California, so there are eight of us. But um, my older brothers and sisters obviously had much more contact with the issues of Jim Crow uh, than I did as a child. But, uh, but I did get the, the feel of it and the, and the backlash of it as we traveled across country because my family um, in Arkansas was very, very um, uh, interested in making sure that those of us who had gone to California knew Arkansas, that we knew our relatives, we knew our family, that we weren't forgotten and they weren't forgotten. And so as a result, we, we made trips to Arkansas every about every four years, uh, which was really a monumental task when one considers that we were a poor family living in the projects of Los Angeles, and yet we traveled across country uh, to go home every four or five years uh, and to make sure that we had contact with our cousins and our aunts and uncles uh, in Arkansas, and still to this day have family reunions and family trips together with those in Arkansas. So, you know, when we talk about travel, I've been asked to address uh, the initial phase of traveling, of what it was like. And, I, and when I was talking with them about various things, because many of you have seen the Green Book, you've looked through it, you see the various locations and places that are there. And it's interesting to me because as I, every time when I'm looking through it, I find, I see a place that I, that I once knew that I had gone to, that I was a part of my life. And I had no idea that it was in this green book, that it was, that it was really even an African-American location sometimes, uh, especially those in California. And so as a result, we end up, uh, we end up with a lot of uh, information that we get. And so what I wanted to try to do in the first part of this presentation and this discussion is really share with you what it's like to be a kid traveling across country, an African-American kid coming out of, of uh, going from Los Angeles to Hope, Arkansas uh, as, a, as a little kid initially and then each, every four years as I grew up and got a chance to really understand what it was like to travel and how I felt in the travels that took place. First of all, living in the projects of Los Angeles, very few of my friends uh, ever traveled. Uh, traveling was an expense, but it was also oftentimes a, an unfortunate experience for many families that they didn't do a lot of travel. Uh, and most black folks didn't go places that they didn't have relatives. You know, it was not like we would just go off somewhere and, and, and enjoy some city somewhere. You went to visit relatives. And when relatives came, they stayed with you. And it didn't matter whether they had 10 kids 
or two kids. Everybody knows what a pallet is. They would put some blankets and stuff together on the floor, and they would make pallets for you, right? So, so it, it, you didn't, you didn't, you, it was almost rude to ever talk about going to somewhere else to stay other than a relative. Uh, I can remember even after we got a few resources and there was a Holiday Inn developed across the country, um, if you didn't stay with a relative, you just insulted them, you know, and, 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 you know, because you're supposed to stay with them. And so, so this whole issue of travel and, and, and going places that you haven't been before is not something that you did often. Uh, and, and many families were very hesitant and reluctant about their children going places that they didn't have family. I, I can remember when I had been accepted to Howard University and I wanted to go to Howard University. Uh, and the first thing my mom said was, we don't know nobody in DC. I wasn't going to meet people. I was going to school, <laughs> okay, you know, but, but it was very clear that they were very, very concerned about tr going places where you didn't have a contact where you didn't have a family, you didn't have someone to pick you up and, and meet you, because it was dangerous if you were African American to, to even in just to, to go to a place that you hadn't been before to try to navigate uh, through Jim Crow, navigate through the rules and regulations that you may not have understood. And, uh, and as a result of that, that became an, always a challenge. My family never adhered to what I would call Jim Crow laws. Uh, first thing, my father never, ever let us say yes or no, sir. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, no. He said, yes is good enough. And so uh, we were different than all of the co my cousins and everybody in the South. I never heard my father ever say, yes, sir, or no, sir, or yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am. Never heard my father ever say anything like that. Uh, because he, he did not, he, he felt that was a, a, an insult to him as an African-American man. And so we were raised with a little edge to us about Jim Crow laws and regulations. And so as a result, travel was always difficult uh, because we were not willing to adhere to the various rules and regulations concerning uh, behavior. We were not willing to go to the back to order food. We were not willing to, to, bake, to take a second seat somewhere when we had a right to, to a first seat. So as a result, we had to be completely self-contained when we traveled. And, um, and so you're, you're two days on the road and you had to be very independent and, and on yourself uh, and, and because you didn't have, sometimes didn't have relatives. We didn't have relatives in Arizona and in New Mexico, uh, nor in Texas. And Texas was the long ride. Uh, and so as a result, we basically had to be self-contained through those three states, uh, basically depending on ourselves, making sure the things that we needed were there. Traveling across country as in, the, in the 50s and the 60s, uh, particularly in the 50s, was really a, um, a unique experience that as a kid you didn't think about it but you, you knew your parents were constantly thinking about what it meant because it was a situation where you had to be extremely careful you could not um, there were some states where if the police stopped you at night you knew something bad was going to happen something horrible was going to happen and so you did your best if you to stay on the main roads even if, there, uh, even if the off-road was a, a quick shortcut. Um, you wanted to stay on the main roads. You wanted to always travel in pairs. Uh, there were eight kids in a car with parents, but we always travel with another family. Because if your car broke down or something happened, you needed help. And you didn't have a cell phone. Kids can't believe that. Uh, you know, you didn't have drop boxes or call boxes on the side of the freeway. Uh, oftentimes you didn't even have road, lights on the road at night. And even on the main highways that you didn't unless you were approaching a city. And so you basically had to make sure that your car was working extremely well. No one ever traveled without major tune-ups of their cars. Even if, there was a, even if there was a death in the family, we'd have a death in the family and my father would have to leave to go and to bury his father or his brother, he had to get his car completely tuned up before he left. Because if your car broke down, you were going to be in peril. You're either going to have somebody charge you a fortune to try to get it. Keep in mind, this is before credit cards, okay? Uh, so you're going to have to figure out that. If, you, if they kept your car any length of time, you had nowhere to stay because you didn't always have a, a, a place like this, or, or some of these places are not in every city. 
So you didn't have anyone. You'd have to figure out how you're going to negotiate some place to stay. If they stopped you, at, you know, and so those things happen. Uh, and so you want to make sure that your tires, your oil, your everything that was in your car was working well because it was not a place that you ever wanted to stop in the middle of the night or even sometimes in the day to try to get repairs. So it became, so, so traveling across country was a very difficult task for families and, um, and, or indivi and, and you never tried to do it as an individual because like I said, if you were stopped along the way, you'd have trouble. And this is prior to your Holiday Inns, your Burger Kings, your McDonald's, your drive throughs everything was people touch. You know, people saw you, you saw them. Uh, you had to go in to get things done. You had to go to the service stations to get the gas. You had to try to negotiate restrooms uh, so that if you pulled into a service station, there may be a restroom that looks halfway decent, but the one for you is over there. And I've seen toilets that were leaning uh, outdoor toilets where there was one in the station, but the one for black people was a, was a basically an outhouse that was leaning. Uh, and uh, so you definitely didn't want to go in there because the thing could fall on you. If you open the door, you couldn't, the smell would kill you. So you ended up most of the time going to the restroom in the fields alongside the roads. You'd stop. That's where you, everybody would have to go to the restroom. You carried plenty of toilet paper. Uh, because you knew you were going to probably have to use it. Even if you got a chance to use one of the indoor facilities, you knew that that, that, that may not last. So once you got past Arizona and New Mexico and hit Texas, you were in the wild, wild west. You know, Texas, you, the other places you could survive because they hadn't developed as strong a Jim Crow set of laws as others. But once you got to Texas, you're going to basically meet individuals who are not going to respect you. And it's interesting that um, I, I think about it because I guess about 10, 12 years ago, my daughter uh, was going to Texas to be uh, in charge of a medical facility, a program at, uh, in, in, uh, in Dallas. And um, at, I think it's Southwestern Hospital, one of the big hospitals in Dallas. And so she bought a car in California and her, pa her dad had passed. And so we drove, she and I were going to drive to Texas. And we didn't have all the limitations. We had hotels at night. We had, you know, we had restaurants. We had Mac McDonald's, Burger Kings we could go to. We had all of those things in place. So we didn't really, it didn't hit me. It didn't worry me as much. But as soon as we crossed Texas and we were on the highways in Texas, um, she noticed, she said, there is a police car following us. And I said, okay, uh, you are doing the right speed, aren't you? She goes, yeah. You've got it on, you know, the, the thing that keeps it at a steady pace. And uh, he just kept following and following, and we just did our little 65, whatever we're supposed to do. And eventually, he turned on his, his light, pulled us over. Fortunately, it was in the middle of the day. And he wanted to know uh, why we didn't have a license plate on our car. Why do we just have this paper on our car? Well, it's California, okay? And when we explained that to him, it wasn't good enough. And so we spent 30 minutes, and I'm an old lady, and she's a physician, and, and he wants to know where we're going, what are you going to do, da da da. And she explained to him that she was going, she had a job, and well, what, do you, what kind of job do you have? You know, she was telling him the job, and he looked, he said, You're kind of young to be a doctor. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So it was one of those things. And, we, and, and there was no, and when we sat on the highway, and this was a big, five-lane highway for the longest, waiting for him to approve us and to call everybody in the world to make sure we hadn't stolen this car, despite all the data that we had on the car. And uh, it, was, it was a wake-up call for her because she had never been in a situation like that, being of, of the younger generation. And, um, and I just, you know, roll with the punches, basically. And eventually, after he, he certified us, then I asked him, why did you stop us? He said, well, I want to find out why you didn't have a license on your car. And I said, do people from California come through here? You know, I mean, we were almost in Dallas at the time. But it was interesting that he just, he followed and followed and followed. And I said, now, you can imagine how you'd feel at night uh, in the Jim Crow South if somebody just followed you and eventually pulled you over, and you don't know what's going to happen. You know, you don't know what the situation's going to be like. So traveling by car was not an easy task. Uh, trying to figure out how you're going, where you're going to get gas, where you're going to get food if you have to buy food. Most of the time you bought 
brought a lot of food. You brought a tremendous amount of food that would last you for three to four days. You had chickens, you had ham, you had uh, all kind of bread, you had a pound cake, you had, I mean, you know, I can remember the menu that we had on every trip to, uh, across country. And, um, and, you, and you'd have to, and, and so you would do these things because you knew that traveling was in peril. And so a lot of African Americans did not travel. They did not go places because they didn't know where they were going and you only went to places generally where you had family. Every now and then as the world began to expand, we'd have to travel places where we had to go for work. But most of the time, you went where you had family. And, and if you read, there's a book called The Delaney Sisters. Uh, if you ever read their book, they talk about uh, that they were always told never be alone, never go by yourself. And as I said, when we drove to Arkansas, my grandmother had a friend who lived somewhere in, in the northern part of Texas, and he was a single guy. It might have been her boyfriend when I think about it, but anyway, uh, <laughs> probably was. But anyway, um, she was single, so whatever. But uh, but um, you know, he would he would he would always go home when we went home, and so we would we would we would you know we would drive together, following each other to make sure everybody was okay, and and we had certain things that we would do. If if one person got pulled over, everybody would pull over. Uh, because you wanted the police to know that there was more than one person watching this situation. And, uh, and he went with us to Arkansas almost every year that we went uh, because he, uh, my brother could drive with him, help him, and those kinds of things. Most of the nights we spent sleeping on the road uh, because you didn't always have a location that you could stay in. Uh, so if you were going to sleep at all, you were going to sleep on the side of the road and you weren't going to sleep long because you didn't want the police or somebody to come up and see your car pulled on the side of the road and everybody then is, is a suspect of something. So as a result, you would, uh, you, you'd sleep, in, and, and when we first started going to Arkansas, my mother did not drive, and so my dad was the only driver in the car with all the kids, which meant he had to stay up for three nights, basically, driving to Arkansas. And we'd stop and he'd get a little rest and then we'd go back again. And, um, and so he, by the time he got to Arkansas, he was just exhausted. But it was something we did like every three to four years, generally every four years going to Arkansas. So when, we, when you talk about travel, you talk about limited resources, you talk about limited facilities. You know, we can think of now that, um, you know, we have hotels that are pretty, that are national uh, chains like Holiday Inn when it came in and some others who didn't have the kind of practices, Motel 6 allowed people to stay, uh, those kinds of things. You had your Burger King, your Kentucky Fried Chicken, your places that you can, you can stop in and, and feel fairly comfortable of getting something to eat. Um, but in the early, in, in before all the chains came into existence and, and um, uh, you basically had to survive on your own going across country. You had to know where you were going. You had to have contacts if necessary. Uh, churches became good contacts. If, you, if something happened to you, you could generally find a, a Baptist church or a minister or someone who could help you or guide you where you needed to go or even provide you with a, a stay that was there. Uh, my relatives often talk about sometimes people's car would break down on, and you'd find them walking along the road and they would get them and bring them into uh, their, their land uh, because they knew that uh, if they continued to walk along the highway, they'd be accused of being a vagabond or something or whatever, and as a result could easily end up shot dead or in jail uh, for, for things they didn't do. And, and once you went before the county seat or whatever it was, a judge, you were pretty much at the mercy of whatever they said you owed. There was no justice. There was no opportunity that was there. And, um, and so as a result, you often saw cases or seen signs of people who had been uh, lynched or burned along the way as you drove. Uh, so driving anywhere from, from the north or from the west or the east into the south was always a, a situation that was very dangerous, uh, uh, one of great peril. And you knew, your parents knew generally how to navigate the situation. Um, as I said, there were places that if you were in certain states, when it got dark, you were in trouble. So you wanted to make sure you knew people to stop along the way. Otherwise, um, you were at, at the mercy of, of, of whatever took place at that time because there was no hearing, there was no justice. You don't read about any cases where people were tried for lynching somebody or raping somebody or whatever. It was just no justice. And, uh, and so you knew that and you knew that there would be very little defense on your part, on your behalf. 
So, um, so we, we traveled. We traveled to Arkansas, like I said, at least every four years when I was, when I was a young person. Uh, I think my first trip back was when I was about seven, six or seven years old. And every four years we went back to see relatives, to see family, because in my, in my, my family's uh, history, uh, that was extremely important. They did not want to, us to lose contact with who we were. And, uh, and lose a sense of, of identity because we moved to California. Uh, very, my father had never been outside of Arkansas in his life until he came to California. Um, and he came here, obviously, because the Klan was after him. And so he came to save his life and eventually the life of his family. Um, but he'd never traveled outside of the circle of Arkansas. My grandfather never left the state of Arkansas at all. And in fact, he could not even conceptualize where we were living in terms of, of California. Uh, it would be funny on Sunday mornings, he would pray every morning, and uh, he would always say, and bless my son in a foreign land. And uh, we said, um, and my cousins were telling us this about this way, how, how long he would pray. And I said, well, who, who was overseas? And uh, they said, no, your daddy was in California. I said, oh, okay, you know. So in his mind, it was a place that they had never been and they never had intention of going. And, uh, and as a result, some of his brothers and sisters died and never came to California to visit us. They had one or two cousins, that, one or two, he had one or two sisters who, were, who loved it, who would travel. And anything happened, they would send them. But uh, my, his brother, his oldest brother, never left Arkansas. Uh, he died in Arkansas some years ago. But he never left Arkansas. He was a farmer and a sharecropper his whole life. Uh, he never left Arkansas at all. My aunts never left Arkansas. Um, even though their kids went off to school in, in, in St. Louis and other places, they never went. They always had to visit. And until we, I, my generation got a little bit older, uh, most of them never came to, to California. We always had to go to Arkansas. They never came to California. They thought it was a one-way highway. You could only go to Arkansas, and that if you left Arkansas, you'd have to probably go through D.C. to get back to California. But. Um, I used to tell them there were two lanes on the highway, one going, one coming, you know, you, you'll get it in the same amount of time, but it, was, uh, but it was clear that traveling was not something they were accustomed to, they, and their attitude was, we don't know anybody between here and Los Angeles, and we don't really know anybody in those other states, because if they did, they'd feel much more comfortable in waiting. So one can only imagine, with that as a, as a backdrop in terms of travel, what it would be like to have something like the Green Book. You know, uh, a book that would uh, that filled a need uh, and 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 basically uh, allowed people to to find places to go. Uh, and, and it's always interesting because most of the when you look at a lot of the inventions in, in African American history, a lot of it was based on race and based on on necessity. You know, whether it's looking at the cotton gin and, and folks believing that somebody else invented it, but it was invented by a black man because that was the work that black people did. Uh, separating the seeds. And so they invented something that would help them do their jobs. Uh, and so a lot of the inventions were done out of absolute necessity, but also the racism that was attached to it. And so the Green Book became one of those things. Um, if you, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a secret thing that black people had. They didn't share it with whites because if they had, uh, they may would have found that those businesses were under attack uh, because they were providing sometimes services or places in their homes where people could stay and lodge and those kinds of things. And so, uh, so it was one of those things that, 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 that we had as a community that people respected. And eventually, I understand that it began to basically be the kind of thing that was being shared. Now, the, the interesting thing is that um, those of you who've been attending the reparations hearings know that California had slaves and that California had Jim Crow laws. And there were restrictions even in California as the state that most of us fled to uh, because of the repressive nature of Jim Crow uh, in the South. But there were still some issues here in California. And, uh, and so as a result of that, the response from African Americans was oftentimes, well, like it was in Allensworth, well, if we can't live here and be prosperous, let us build our own. Let us create our own communities. Let us create our own places of entertainment. Let us do that. And so what we have here is, um, is, is some photos of, of, um, of the various things that took place. And, and some of them are interesting because um, uh, I've seen several of them. And as I look through the book, I've seen some of the others that, that were a part of, of California's history, Los Angeles history particularly. But, uh, but we did a little bit of everything. And it's kind of in, in terms of what took place. I think on, the, on this side here, right here standing, is the Murray Dude Ranch. And this is in Victorville, uh, not far from here. 
And, uh, and there was a dude ranch that was developed by, uh, it was, and it was the first time it was included in the book was in 1948. Um, and it was, this dude ranch was established in 1930 by Leela and Noli Murray. It's the Murray Dude Ranch in Victorville. Uh, and it was celebrated in, as a thriving and dynamically uh, black-owned vacation spot in the heyday, uh, offering everything from tennis, golf, swimming, uh, riding, lodging, and first-class meals to all of its guests. Uh, the Dude Ranch began attracting celebrities of all kinds, and after it featured a spread in Life magazine alongside the boxer Joe Lewis, um, more others, others began to frequent it more often. Several celebrities included the architect Paul Williams, who enjoyed staying at the ranch, which also served as a backdrop of a number of movies. Uh, although it was a haven for African Americans longing for a welcoming vacation experience and one of the few such places available to them at the time, in a few years, people of all backgrounds were welcome to stay at the ranch. Uh, and to our knowledge, this business is it's not still in existence, but it was a dude ranch up here in, in Victorville. And that's a couple there that started it in the 1930s. Um, it's kind of remarkable that, uh, that, you know, we often think of cowboys and Indians and Long Ranger and whomever else without us in it. And here these folks had started a dude ranch. Here in Sacramento, you guys had a lot of things going on in the black community. And as I've talked to some different folks, um, uh, over the years of, of, of being here, I've discovered that in, particularly in the Oak Park area, there were a number of uh, businesses that existed that particularly catered to African Americans, and a number of them here downtown as well. Uh, the, the Taylor's Drugstore, uh, where's Taylor's Drugstore, right here, Taylor's Drugstore, uh, was uh, included in the Green Book in 1952. Uh, it's lo it was located at 6th and M Street. Uh, it was called the Taylor Drugstore, and it, and it was at also next to the main hotel, uh, which were both um, uh, part of Sacramento's life. Uh, they appear to have been torn down as a part of Sacramento's de redevelopment projects in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, that destroyed a vibrant part of this neighborhood and the community. Uh, this business and building no longer exists and was located by uh, where the current John Moss uh, Federal Building is currently located. That's where it was. Uh, the interesting thing is that a lot of... Um, uh, African-American facilities and businesses and places that people could go were, were really destroyed during re redevelopment in terms of people coming in, same thing happened in San Diego, people coming in wanting to make the city better, quote unquote. Uh, oftentimes the facilities had not gotten as much attraction or attention because the population had moved out from the center of the city to other places. And as a result, they didn't see the value of that. And every now and then, every now and then, someone in that community would, who was a, a historian or someone who was involved in trying to restore things in our community would rise up and say, no, you can't tear that down. You've got to do something better. You've got to do something because that's, that's an important part of our history. And so the Taylor's Drugstore that was on 6th and M here in Sacramento was one of those pieces. Um, I talk about the fact that in San Diego, the Douglas Hotel, now this is, this is the Douglas Hotel, which is a huge facility uh, in San Diego. Um, and um, I remember when they, got, when they tore it down in 19, I think in 1985, when they really got rid of the Douglas Hotel. But it had been, um, it was called, interesting enough, San Diego used to be called the Harlem of the West, if you can imagine that, a little sleepy San Diego. Uh, it was called the Harlem of the West. It had uh, a vibrant downtown community. And, um, and, and it's interesting because the only, I think the only company that made uh, parachutes was a black company downtown San Diego, and, uh, which is unbelievable. And, uh, and so there were a lot of vibrant things going on in the center of the city where black people live downtown because uh, as the city spread out, then we kind of followed them in that, in that sense. But the Douglas Hotel was a huge hotel in, in San Diego. It was, um, and it was in the 1953 edition of, this, uh, of the Green Book. Uh, it was done in 1924 uh, when, the, when they built the hotel. Robert Rowe, he owned the Douglas Hotel known as, as I said, the Harlem of the West. Uh, and black visitors would come and would stay in downtown San Diego at the Douglas Hotel. It was the only, it was the only hotel that catered to African Americans in San Diego for many, many years. Um, it featured a barber shop, a dry cleaners, a card and billiard room, uh, and it also had a place called the Creole Palace, which was a, really a nightclub, the black nightclub in, in, in San Diego at the Douglas Hotel. 
And so this place was like the center of life, the Douglas Hotel for African Americans in, in San Diego. Uh, it in, some of its entertainers included people like Count Basie, uh, who came in with his band, the Ink Spots, uh, Duke Ellington, uh, Billy Holiday came to San Diego, the Mills Brothers, Bessie Smith, Lionel Hampton, all these folks performed at the Douglas Hotel. And, uh, and so it was really the centerpiece was there. And so it was in, in 1985, it was torn down. And, uh, and, uh, and, and when, uh, who was it? Uh, when Ramsey, who owned the hotel, died, and he died in 1985, he was often called the mayor of San Diego's Harlem because it was his hotel that was a center of life for African Americans. Uh, interestingly enough, right now there is a uh, center city development piece there, and what they've done in San Diego is they have identified all the locations of the black businesses. So if you go to the center city development, there was a young woman who passed a few years ago who was really into this and helped us to develop it and to develop the, the activities and the life in San Diego, the black section of downtown San Diego that really stretched into several areas. And, and like, like I said, in most things, people think it, life gets better when you move further away and you move up to the suburbs and you do whatever you're going to do. And so a lot of things in the San Diego community were, were dispersed. But, uh, but uh, the Douglas Hotel was a, was a place for everybody to come. And it was a huge facility downtown uh, San Diego. I often wonder about the value of that land right now uh, because it's so large and San Diego's property is so expensive. The next item that was California had, and, and this one was really shocked me when I got the book because this was an integral part of my life, the Clifton Cafeteria. I had no idea it was black owned when I was a kid. And my grandmother loved the Clifton Cafeteria. So after we moved to California, um, she loved going to the movies on Tuesdays because my grandmother was also a, she was just kind of a wild woman, wonderful person, but, but she was also into gambling, okay? And so, um, she wasn't a traditional grandmother. You know, she didn't sit around baking cookies and cornbread and greens and stuff. I mean, she could make all that stuff, but that was not my grandmother. My grandmother was like in the future, okay? She was truly in the future. She was cool. She was in the future. But she loved to gamble. And so on Tuesdays, we would go to uh, the movies downtown because they always had like a raffle, you know, you know, ticket pool from your ticket or whatever it is, and you can run $25, $50, whatever. So we went to, she loved movies, so we always went to the movies uh, on Tuesdays because of that. But before we went to the movies, uh, my sister and I, we would go, and my dad would drop us off at downtown at 7th and Broadway, which, where the Clifton Cafeteria was. And we went to the Clifton Cafeteria every, during the summer, every Tuesday night. It was an amazing place. It was huge, you know, four or five floors of all kinds of things. It had tropical settings and trees and had a big old bear in the middle and all kinds of things. So it was really interesting and it was truly a cafeteria because you got your tray and you went through the line and you picked your jello, you picked your whatever. And I think they had like, I don't know how many flavors of jello, any kind of jello you want they had. Uh, and they still have that today, but it's really interesting. That, so they had all this stuff and food, and it was fun. It was fun. But I had no idea it was a part of the black community uh, because it was downtown. And when you went down there, almost everybody was in, at, the, at the cafeteria. But it was a black-owned business for years. And, um, and, and, and obviously, a lot of African Americans never got a chance to be in other places. And so this was one. And I guess the fact that it didn't serve greens and cornbread and stuff like that, I didn't think it was black owned. <laughs> you know, because generally you go to these events, and here's the color picture down here, and you can see the tropical trees and stuff. Because normally, you, you know, if you go to a black restaurant, you expect some greens and cornbread and, you know, some chick fried chicken, you know, some basic stuff, basic food. So that, you know, Clifton had some fried chicken and some things like that, but they had like spinach, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I never, I never ever thought they were black until I got a hold of this green book, and I realized that Clifton Cafeteria was founded uh, uh, by Clifford and, and Nelda Clinton, uh, Clinton, and then uh, uh, it was on Sixth and Olive, and, I, and, and, and basically it had all, it had three floors of, of activities, it had tropical trees, it had waterfalls, it had 12 waterfalls in this place, uh, it had sherbet gushing volcanoes, and, uh, and, and, and like I said, it had artificial rainforest and thunder and lightning and all kinds of stuff that took place at Clifton's Cafeteria. It was a lot of fun to go there to eat. Um, and, uh, and, and, it was, and, and, and as a result, everyone came to Clifton's Cafeteria. It was a downtown spot.
spot. A lot of African Americans worked downtown at that time in the various uh, factories and, and stores. Uh, and so Clifton was really a treat. And, and they also had the idea that if you couldn't afford to pay, particularly since it was founded in, in 1931 during the Depression, you basically could live there free. I mean, you could eat there free, okay? And so as a result, they didn't have a whole lot of limitations on folks that were there. But it's interesting that it, that it shut down in the 1960s, but it has reopened. It's reopened, the Clifton Cafeteria. I passed by it on New Year's Eve, and if you look it up, it reopened in 2015. It has the big bear in the center. It has fountains. It has everything. And it is the Clifton Cafeteria. Now, I'm not sure who owns it, whether it's black owned, but it truly is a tribute to the fact that it was there. So uh, it did reopen. And I knew that because some of my staff went to it. And I was shocked. I said, you guys went to Clifton Cafeteria? I said, I used to go to that as a kid. I thought it was gone. They said, no, it's back. People lined up around the building to go into Clifton's Cafeteria. So if you get a chance to go to LA, you may want to see the new Clifton Cafeteria. They've gone in and renovated it and made it better. I see my time is running out, so I'm going to have quickly go. The Claremont Hotel in Berkeley is up here. Uh, this is a huge hotel. Where is it? Um, at the top. The Claremont Hotel uh, is, uh, is at Berkeley. It was opened in 1915. Uh, it was once a, a beautiful estate called a castle. Uh, and, they, and this family, uh, the Thornburgs, basically uh, struck it rich during the gold rush and developed this, this place where people could come. African Americans mostly came to that. And eventually, it opened up to a number of other individuals. Um, the, um, eventually, it was sold, but it's a tremendous investment, and it has beautiful houses, and it's a, I understand the building still exists today. If you go to Berkeley, you can look for it, and you can find it, because it's still in existence. Uh, Camp Curry, we had a number of things in Yosemite. Um, I think it's up there at the very top. Uh, it was featured in the 1962 edition of the Green Book. Yosemite's Half Dome Village, established by David and Jenny Curry in 1899, was originally called the, the Camp Curry and later Curry Village. It was designed to provide more affordable accommodations for Yosemite tourists than the resort hotels that were there. Uh, this place still exists, and because of the legal dispute over trademark names, it is now called the, the Curry Village. They changed it to Half Dome Village in 2016, but it's still in existence if you get a chance to go there. The YWCA in Los Angeles became a major place, and most of us know that the Ys were always, because of their focus on Christianity, were always involved in race relations and change and those kinds of things. Uh, and the Los Angeles one uh, was in the book as well, because obviously most of the time in, in, uh, you could always stay at the Y. We don't think of it as, today as that, but the YWCA's, YMCA's always had places for people to come. And they would encourage young people who were coming into cities to stay at the Y because of the safety of being at the Y and the environment in the Y. So we had that one. Uh, Dunlap Hotel, the Dunlap Dining in Sacramento. Uh, this, this was a place that was in, actually in someone's home, right down at the bottom. And uh, I understand Earl Warren, when he became governor, actually had his dinner, dinner at the Dunlap Hotel, his first dinner as governor of the state of California. Um, he, uh, Dunlap's daughter worked as a waitress and, uh, at the hotel and one who gave them the information that Earl Warren did his first meal there. It still exists, although the Dunlap Dining Room collection is now in the Center for Sacramento History. So all of the, a lot of the, the plates and things like that are now in Sacramento's history because of Dunlap. And this was a situation where it was just a small living room that someone opened up and began to uh, serve meals in their living room. Uh, once again, Yosemite, uh, the Yosemite Lodge is uh, over here and at the bottom, and this is a place that had several different, it had like 100, and they had 15 different sep separate buildings and 245 rooms. Some of the places were small and had, and, and just for one person, a lot of them were large for families, but it provided an opportunity for that. The buildings were named after species of flowers at the time, and, uh, and it basically, can, uh, one of them can, does contain kind of a large family room. But when you go to Yosemite, think about the fact that there were people there who looked like me, who basically owned property, owned land, and ran a number of the facilities that's there. So, you know, when we think about uh, um, all of this, let me, let me try to conclude and then get to our question. You know, travel, we think, we take travel for granted today. And I think about it, I flew in this morning uh, for this lecture and I'm flying back tonight because I got some more things to do in the morning in San Diego. So we kind of take travel for granted. Uh, but think about the fact that those, that it's, it's truly a luxury to us now. And, 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 uh, and oftentimes a necessity to be able to do the job that we do. 
And yet, um, for so long, it was, it was difficult for those who didn't have legal status. In the United States. When I say legal status, in other words, somebody could harm you and nobody would do anything about it. So it became difficult at that point. It became difficult if you went to places where you didn't have relatives and you didn't have friends because you, didn't have, you had nowhere to stay, you didn't know where you were going to eat, all those kinds of things, which made you extremely vulnerable. And most of our families, most of your aunts and grandparents and great-grandparents never traveled at all or did very little travel beyond the circle of their family. They, if they were in Hope, Arkansas, they may travel to Little Rock because you could get there in a couple of hours and travel back. But to go into a state, into Memphis, which was just across the water, they were not likely to do because they didn't know anybody in Memphis. And as a result of not knowing folks and not having uh, oftentimes the resources and the support, it limited your ability to travel. It limited your circle in terms of where you are and those kinds of things. And so that was a psychology that was involved in with many of our aunts, with many of our parents and grandparents, that they didn't travel very much. They, were very, they felt they were safe where they were because they knew people. And knowing people meant that if, if somebody picked you up, the police officer, your mother cleaned, houses for, cleaned, cleaned the house for the, the man's wife, and as a result, she could talk him into letting you out of jail. It was this kind of transactional relationship that was more personal than legal, and as a result, you didn't, you didn't venture very far from that in terms of the center of, of what you did. Uh, we traveled because we had people in Arkansas, and I had an aunt who insisted that we come back to Arkansas to visit. Uh, but we went through Arizona uh, uh, and New Mexico, and then when we got to Texas, we were in the South. And it was at that point that we had to really begin to uh, navigate the reality of limited resources, making sure you didn't let your car break down. When we hit El Paso, our goal in hitting El Paso was to make it out of Texas before midnight. And, uh, and we did, and Texas was a long, long ride. But we would, buy, we would stay up, we'd get up like, if we got to El Paso, we would ho if we got there early in the morning, nobody stopped to do anything, we got on the road and we got through Texas and, and at a reasonable time because we knew that if we had to stop in Texas with all the challenges that were there, we may not get through as, in the way we wanted. And we had no resources to basically fall back on in those particular situations. So travel was difficult. And you often see movies and see things of people who traveled and horrible things happened to them. They remember those experiences. But the Green Book was one of the ways in which the community attempted to intervene and, uh, and to make a difference in, in people's lives and to, and to really look at this. Uh, there's a movie out, and it's not the Green Book, but there was a movie, and I'm blocking on it now. It's, it's, it's some weird name that was a series on television. And the guy was the one doing, yes, the, uh, yeah, what is it called? Yeah, yeah, Lovecraft, yes, Lovecraft Country. And, and that guy is a guy who's driving around basically producing the Green Book. You know, he's going to different places, and sometimes you see them at night kind of concerned about where they're going to stay, but he was one of those persons who traveled around to collect the information. And of course, as we learn the history of the Green Book, we know that people often sent in information uh, to add to this book because this became invaluable to people. This was better than AAA's travel book for, for black folks. And, uh, because, you know, so, and, and we all think that's pretty great, but nonetheless, this was a little bit better than that, and better than the Internet, because it had race in, involved in it, so you had some sense of security as you travel. But I'm going to open it up to questions. I'm more than happy to take questions. I was supposed to take questions at 1.45, and it is now 1.45. <laughs> have one question? That sounds good. Just one? Hmm? Okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> I ain't even gonna ask this question. Go ahead. What's the next one? No, no. <laughs> Someone asked me a question, and, and, and I say this because um, this question came before the California Legislative Black Caucus when I was chair of the caucus. And it says, what are your thoughts on the naming or renaming of Negro Bar and possible loss of historical context or information? Um, and so one has asked that question. Now, I think I'm trying to remember uh, when it came to us at the Black Caucus. Uh, my position was that sometimes names are extremely important. And the Negro Bar is an important name. 
And there's no, no there's, I mean, it, first of all, it's not the end bar, which is the word we don't want. But keep in mind that we were once, we have been called Negroes. And there was a period in our history where that was vi a, a victory and pride because it was Negro with a capital N. And it wasn't that other N. And so people embraced that, that word as a state of pride. And I've known African Americans uh, who, who are no longer in existence now who, would n who took pride in that term and, and, and thought we should never just toss it out because it's a part of our history. And it, was a, and it was a battle that we won. And as we have continued to struggle with a definition of self, uh, because when somebody gives you a name uh, and, and it's not a nice name, you're constantly trying to define who you are. And so Negro became an important word with a capital N. Uh, then, we, then we became Afro-Americans. Then we became African-Americans. And we became black. And then we became African. And so we've gone through some names. And each one of those journeys is a reflection of us and our continuing search for who we are. And it's a long journey. Uh, it has lots of twists and turns to it. But we should never be... Um, uh, uh, embarrassed by it, especially when it's a name that we embraced ourselves. Not somebody gave it to us, but we embraced it ourselves. And so we have lots of discussions about names, but I was opposed to taking the name off because I felt it had historical significance. It's like the National Council of Negro Women. It's like the NAACP, the National Association for Colored People. I mean, these are, these are organizations that in that era in which they exist, if you look at the term colored, in the era in which it was this, that was a powerful term. Colored was, was really like throwing your fist up, okay? It, it was not something to be ashamed of. And so, and so as you study your history and you study African Americans or Africans struggle for identity and, to, and for, and for self-determination and self-naming, uh, we have to honor all of that. And, uh, and so I was opposed to that. I don't know what they've done with it, but I was opposed to it, and I didn't conduct any movement to stop it, you know what I'm saying? And I do know how to do movements to stop things. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I didn't get involved in that one because I didn't think it was, I didn't think we needed to. Um, okay, that was another one. I talked to that share information about the movement of blacks and of the capital uh, area in Del Paso and Oak Park. Okay, gentrification, a lot of that is occurring. A quick question. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh -huh. Quick question. The one person would like to hear about the history of Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach and my thoughts on its return to the rightful owners. I say hallelujah. Uh, it was stolen from them uh, under false pretense that it was going to do something and it never did. Uh, and that family, you can only imagine what, would have, what resources they would have had if they had maintained that beach and been allowed to develop it in Manhattan, a beautiful beach. Uh, it's, it's justice that it was returned to them. I'm very proud of those who worked on that, Mr. Bradford and others, uh, to get some justice. Because oftentimes people tell you, well, it's, it's too far removed. I don't remember. I can't. It costs too much now, you know, and it's not what it used to be. And, you know, you hear that a lot when people have stolen your stuff. And, um, you know, they, they steal your house or steal your property, and then they, they put uh, maybe a swimming pool in the back of it and then tell you, well, it's, what can I do? I've improved your property. You know, give it back. Uh, thank you very much for the improvement. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I, Bruce's Beach is going to be exciting. And I think the good thing that I learned from uh, it was also, in addition to it being returned to them, they've also established some agreement about... Um, the economics of it and how that they're going to uh, do some things with that community so that um, with that with that family so that they won't lose it because oftentimes they'll give you back your property and then tell you that you owe seven million dollars in taxes uh, because of the value of the property so they have done some things to make sure that that doesn't happen in terms of some contracts with the city and the county to give these folks a chance to do the development that's there so that you don't end up with a bitter bittersweet experience uh, so I'm very proud of my colleagues who did Bruce Beach, and, and I, I look forward to great things, and hopefully I'll get a chance to go visit Bruce Beach. I probably visited as a kid and didn't know who owned it, you know, one of those kind of things in Manhattan. Uh, somebody asked about the movement uh, out of the Capitol area to Del Paso Heights and back in Oak Park. Um, I don't know enough about it, other than I just know that we often move out of places that we probably shouldn't. 
and then people double back on us and then we can't move back because we don't have the money to come back because they, they gentrify it and take your house that, that they gave you nothing for and then uh, improve it a little bit but then put a sign up to make it a special community or something. And that happened in LA uh, in the area where a lot of the movie stars used to live off of Adams Avenue and those houses were absolutely fabulous and they sold them for like sixty, seventy thousand uh, dollars because they were, you know, they, the community didn't value it, people didn't value it and they moved away and uh, these were places that uh, Adela Reese and other folks lived in and people came in and scraped the paint off of the wood and discovered it was, it was uh, ebony or mahogany or whatever it was and those houses now are worth a fortune. Uh, they regentrified it and, and same thing in DC. You know, uh, and that happens across. So people have to pay close attention to what we give away, what we sell. Uh, our children should value our property, should value what it means. But, but that's a part of the, that's a part of the ongoing challenge that African Americans have. That one of the one of the things that happened to us as a people is that we lost interest in ourselves, and uh, and as a result. Somebody else is what Aretha once told someone, a guy she was dating, he couldn't figure out why black people didn't help black people. And he said, she said, that's because black folks think white folks' ice is colder. And, uh, and that's true. And so as a result, we don't value what is in our community and what we have, and we have to begin to do that. And hopefully this generation will see the importance of the history that's there. Uh, one last question, and then I know us, we've got some other folks coming in. Oh, okay. I, I was reminded that I should thank the California Museum and the Smithsonian. <laughs> I want to thank them so much for this exhibit. If you haven't had a chance to go and see the Green Book exhibit, it's amazing. Uh, it really is in inspiring and, and motivating. And uh, I hope you will get a chance to look at the book. And if you find places that still are in existence, that you visit them. Uh, to see what they're about. I, I, like I said, I, I realized Clifton Cafeteria, I had no idea it was a tie to this. So I'm going to try to make arrangements next week when I'm in, in uh, LA next weekend to, take, uh, to go back and visit Clifton Cafeteria with my sisters and brothers because that was a, m a major part of our life in, in Los Angeles and my grandmother's life as well. Listen, thank you guys for indulging me. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much.